This is the end of the book of Romans. And for us, this has been 47 messages, so plus holidays. It's been just a little bit over a year that we've been in the book of Romans. So I know it feels like it's been forever, but if you were to tell me at the beginning, we're going to be one year in the book of Romans, I'd say, well, that sounds about right. It's about that important for us to study together. I hope as we've gone through it, you've been able to see the value of verse-by-verse Bible teaching. Several of you have told me that you really appreciate me taking the time to address certain issues and to speak about them so boldly. And what I very often will say is, well, it's really hard to avoid it when you're reading the passage and just explaining what it says. Uh, And this is one of the reasons we do that is is because it doesn't allow us to skip stuff. And we're certainly not going to skip the greetings section of the book of Romans, not even that. Let me take a moment to remind you of our outline of the book of Romans. And if you have not been here for most of this, it's all on the website. There's video and there's audio. Go ahead and take a listen. It's free, of course, and uh, you can check it out there. But chapter 1, verses 1 through 17 is Paul's introduction. He just says, hello, my name is Paul. He's never been to Rome before. And then he gives that famous verse, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and his salvation. That's kind of his thesis statement. If you remember that from back when you were in school and you had to write essays. That's the point. Then in chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 8, verse 39, you have Paul discussing the gospel in all of its glorious detail, just from start to finish, bad news to good news, pre-salvation all the way to our future in heaven. And I'll break that section down a little more in just a moment. Chapter 9, 10, and 11 are about Israel. It's asking the biggest theological church question of the day, which is, What are we supposed to do with all these Gentiles that are getting saved? In fact, way more Gentiles are getting saved than Jews are getting saved. How does that make any sense? Jesus was our Messiah. And that's what 9, 10, and 11 are all about. Chapter 12 through 15, so chapter 12, verse 1 through chapter 15, verse 13, halfway through chapter 15, was application. He talked about love. He talked about spiritual gifts. He talked about obeying the government. He talked about uh, the stronger and weaker brother, how to handle differences of opinion on things that are not doctrinal. That was, of course, a very practical section for us. And then from chapter 15, verse 14, to the end of chapter 16, Paul is concluding. He gives the reasons why he's coming. He says hello to a bunch of people, and then he closes. And this is where we are today. Now, if I can take the time to break down again that section about the gospel, because chapter 1, verse 18 through chapter 8, verse 39 really is the heart of the book of Romans. Not that the rest of it is unimportant or even lesser important, but the the meat of Romans is this section. We started out in chapter 1, verse 18 through chapter 3, verse 20, which is about condemnation. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That we need help because everybody is dead in their sins and destined for hell. From chapter 3, verse 21, through chapter 5, verse 21, we have the first part of the good news, which is justification. This is the past aspect of salvation, that in a moment, your sins were forgiven because Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead. So while you were guilty, you were declared to be just or righteous. Then from chapter 6, verse 1, through chapter 8, verse 17, you have the present aspect of salvation, which is sanctification, meaning you've been saved, but you are also being saved, and that the Holy Spirit comes upon you and enables you to leave behind the old life of sin, not as in you're going to lose your salvation, but as in the grace of God is compelling you and transforming you to be the kind of person that God has always destined you to be. And then the second half of chapter 8, verses 18 through 39, is all about glorification, the future aspect of salvation. What happens after this? He talks about the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. That's where you have that verse that says, God makes all things work together for good to those who love God. That one day we have a destiny forever in heaven with Christ Jesus. So knowing all of that, the book of Romans canonically, serves in the New Testament, I believe, as the definitive doctrinal explanation of the story of Jesus. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four Gospels, four versions of the story of Jesus. 
Then you have the book of Acts, which is the other narrative in the New Testament, the story of the early church. So we read about what happened. And then in Romans, which was positioned there, not for this reason, but I think the Holy Spirit probably superintended it, right after the book of Acts, you have an explanation of what all this means. You could interpret all kinds of ways what the death of Jesus meant, and people do, don't they? But Paul tells us in Romans what this means, the forgiveness of sins, the justification, sanctification, glorification. Compared to the other epistles, it has far less to do with the immediate situation of that church than it does every church. So this is why we did Luke, we did Acts, and we did Romans as a church. We've done some other things too, but if you can get the story of Jesus, the story of the church, and the explanation of what it all means, you're, you're off, on a, off to a pretty good start here. But we've been here in chapter 16 or chapter 15 last week, and Paul was explaining his plans to the church. He says, I would love to come visit you in Rome. I haven't been there yet. I've been on other journeys. And because there was already a church in Rome, I didn't want to plant a church where there already was one. Talk about Paul's calling, right? was to plant churches in new places. But what he tells them is, I'm on my way to Jerusalem. I'm bringing a, a financial collection for the church there from the Gentiles. And when I go out on my fourth trip, my final destination is Spain. And I want to stop at Rome along the way. So I'm writing this letter, not just to encourage you, but to kind of let you know that I'm on the up and up as far as my doctrine goes, so that when you see me, you'll know who I am and you'll be ready to receive me and hopefully help me out. And then in chapter 16, he's going to conclude the letter. And most of this is just a long list of names, uh, of greetings. And we're going to go pretty quickly through them, but... I, when you stop and look at what he says, it really sheds some very interesting light on the early church. And the fact that we don't know any of these names, but they were significant enough to Paul to be included in the Bible, this reminds us that there was a whole lot of people part of the church that nobody knows their names, nobody knows their stories or who they, they were, an awful lot like you and me. That nobody might know our story or know who we are, but the Lord knows and that that's always what has constituted his church is ordinary people who have found grace in Christ Jesus. And then in the middle, Paul's going to remind us to beware of those that want to try to bring division into the church. So he gives a big list of names of all these different people that are together in Christ. And then he tells them, watch out for somebody who wants to disrupt that unity over something that ought to hold us together through false teaching. And we're going to talk about that in the middle. Because Knowing everything that we've learned in Romans about the gospel, that's what binds us together as Christians. And when somebody comes in and wants to threaten that, then we absolutely have to close ranks and say we're not compromising on this. So it'll be a great way for us to end this book. We'll begin by just reading these first two verses, and then we'll uh, have a much longer section following that. Paul writes, I commend you to our sister Phoebe. Would have been pronounced Phoebe, but we say Phoebe, so we'll stick with that a servant of the church at Sencrie, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Okay, so Paul commends Phoebe. What does that mean? Well, this is the woman who was carrying the letter Romans. She was the one that took it in her hands and got on a boat and took it to Rome and delivered it to the churches. So, that's another little detail that kind of sits behind all of this. We don't even really think about, oh yeah, somebody would have actually had to deliver this letter, right? And in fact, she probably was not only delivering the letter, meaning handing it to somebody, she probably was the one that was reading the letter and undoubtedly had spoken to Paul about exactly what he meant about certain things and perhaps was there to help answer questions about what the letter meant. She said, it says she's from Sencrie. Sencrie was just a couple miles to the southeast of Corinth. So we know Paul was in Corinth, which is the church of the Corinthians, when he wrote this letter. So Phoebe likely was one of those Corinthians. Even though she was from Sencrie, they were so close that it probably wouldn't have made any difference. Which, if you read the book of Corinthians, you can think, all right, Phoebe would have been in the mix. She would have been one of these people. And it gives two different titles of Phoebe here. They're not really titles, they're descriptive, but it says that she is a servant. This is the word diakonos. This is where we get the word deacon from. You can hear that in the Greek, diakonos, like diakon, right, deacon. So 
This is either just a general term saying she's a servant. She serves us all. She's been de delegated to do this mission. Or it, Paul is actually saying that she had the office of what's called a deaconess in the church. And uh, there are, of course, churches that still have deaconesses to this day. And then we have the other one, which is a patron. So she's been a patron, which is a prostatis in Greek. What this means is that Phoebe probably, when Paul was in Sencrie, she probably hosted him in her home. It's also possible that the church in Sencrie would have met in her home. The fact that she was able to host and support Paul and also have the ability to travel to Rome and deliver this letter probably indicates that Phoebe was a woman of some means. So that just sheds a little bit of light on who she would have been. So you, you got to think of that, that when, when Paul finishes this letter, and we're going to finish looking at who helped him write it and all that, and he would have put it into the hands of Miss Phoebe and sent her off, and she would have had to show up and say, I have a letter from Paul the Apostle for all of you here in Rome. And she, maybe they would have all come together. Maybe she would have gone to the different house churches, and she would have read it, and maybe they would have had questions. And she'd say, well, here's what Paul told me. So I, I love just getting the little background of the story of how this was done. Now, there are three different instances in chapter 16 where people try to take the descriptions of the women in the church at Rome and use it for a feminist agenda to undo other parts of the Bible. Now, I'm not just using that as a cheap political term. I mean that quite literally, that there are feminist theologians with a capital F that are always working to dismantle the patriarchy of scripture, as they say, and they use three of the women in chapter 16 for that reason. So Phoebe is the first one. So there's going to be three of these little points that I'm going to pull out, and I think these will probably seem so obvious to you that it wouldn't be an issue, but you'll be surprised how big a mountain people can make out of a scriptural molehill. So, when it says that Phoebe was doing this and was a deacon or diakonos, they say, now what this means is Phoebe obviously had a position of authority and leadership. In fact, she was probably the pastor of the church at Corinth because, look, he says that she was a servant of the church, a deacon of the church. I think you can all see that that is really pressing that text too far. Because what folks will say is that the church has constantly beat down women and suppressed women and doesn't want them to do anything. And look at Phoebe doing all this great work. Well, first of all, I do not identify myself or anybody that I have grown up with as part of a church that has beaten down or suppressed women. I have always been in churches where women have had a very important role, including this one here. You know, we don't have formal deacons or deaconesses here at Calvary Chapel Trustville. I'm not opposed to that. We just don't do it. But we have ministry teams, and we have a couple ministry team leaders that are women. Sarah leads the children's ministry, for example. And, you know, Catlin leads the women's ministry. So, you know, we have people like that. So I, first of all, deny the premise that we are suppressing and beating down women, first of all. But secondly, what, what that comes out, to is they say, well, the Bible says that women are not permitted to teach or exercise authority over men. And look, there's Phoebe, a diakonos. Okay, so this passage is obviously making clear that Paul valued women in the church, as the Lord Jesus did too. And this passage would have been incredibly radical at the time when it was written. But to take this passage that is a little ambiguous, meaning is this, she is a diakonos with a capital D, meaning she had a position in the church, or is this just a lowercase d? She's a servant. We love her. She's always helping out, and she was on her way to Rome, so we're going to send her off. She obviously had an important position, but to dismantle what Paul says in other places because of what he says about Phoebe here is no good. 1 Timothy 2.12, Paul said, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And in fact, 1 Corinthians has quite a bit to say about some women in the church at Corinth that were being very disruptive and in fact trying to outwardly cast off the authority of their husbands because they were free in Christ. And Paul gives a pretty strong rebuke to that church. And Phoebe was part of that church. So you need to keep all of that in mind too. Now, I don't think any normal Christian without any agenda is going to read that verse and therefore try to disrupt something. But there are people that they made this their goal. Because this feminist theology has poisoned the church's view of what authority means. We say, well, because a woman is not permitted to teach or exercise authority, therefore she's less than. 
Even though didn't Jesus say anybody who's going to lead in his church must be the what of all? The servant of all. We don't lord it over each other. Even people who are in authority are not to be domineering and dominating and, and all of that. We believe that Jesus Christ was in submission to his Father. And we don't think any less of Jesus for that, do we? We know that Jesus Christ was also in submission to the Holy Spirit while he was on this earth. We know that later on, G the Father is going to give all authority to Christ. And then Christ will give all that authority back. Authority is not something that we look to and cling to and allow ourselves to be defined by in the Christian church. But when we live in a culture like we do, that has a real hard time with the way that the roles in marriage and in the church have traditionally been understood, we can take that and import it into the way we read Scripture. What we see in Scripture is that Paul and the other apostles and Jesus Christ and the Old Testament had established order in God's church, that the men are to lead and the women are to follow. Now, if you then take that to mean that she's just got to sit down, shut up, and not ever do anything, well, then, yeah, you are going to run into the rocks of the New Testament here. Because she was carrying the letter of Romans and reading out loud the letter of Romans and perhaps answering questions about the letter of Romans. So the idea that being in submission and not being the one in charge makes you less of a person, can we stop believing that, please? And this is what the world will say about the church. Well, you don't allow women to be pastors. We don't allow most people to be pastors, first of all. <laughs> Jesus said, let not many of you become teachers, for you will receive a stricter judgment. It's going to be harder for me on judgment day than you. So just take a, take a breath here. It's going to be nice for you. I'm going to have to not just answer for myself, but for you. So that's why the writer of the Hebrew says, please make it easy for your pastor, because he's, he's got to handle your, your story when he gets to heaven, too. But look, let's, let's never devalue the way God has ordered things. Phoebe was a great sister in the early church. She might have very well been a deaconess with that role. But to then take that and say, I, it's not fair for it to be this way. That's the way God has ordained it. And that's the way that we're going to have it. So I hope you can see that. Like, you, really, you just look at that little half of a verse and you're going to develop a whole theology out of it. Oh, just wait. It gets even better. Let's read verses. Uh, I, let's just do this as we go. Verses 3 through 16. Check this out. Greet Prissa and Aquila, would have been pronounced Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. This opens up the longest list of greetings found in any of Paul's epistles, which is interesting because Paul had never been to Rome. So how is he able to greet all these people? Well, we know from Acts 18 that at one point, Emperor Claudius dispersed the Jews out of Rome. He said he kicked them out in the 40s AD. So Paul, this is where he actually met Prissa and Aquila. And I'm sure he would have met a lot of people that weren't allowed to live in Rome anymore because he traveled through the synagogues around that area. I also think he's going out of his way to greet more people because, remember, he's trying to establish his credentials as an apostle. So he wants the church there to know, I know an awful lot of you here in Rome. And then they can, they can answer for Paul. And so, of course, he first mentions Prissa and Aquila. This is the same Priscilla and Aquila from the book of Acts. Priscilla is what's called a diminutive form. If you don't know what that is, John is a name. Johnny is the diminutive form of the name. So William is the name. Billy is the diminutive form. So whenever Luke gives the name of somebody in the book of Acts, he always uses the diminutive form of their name, which is pretty cool. He calls her Priscilla. They call her Prissy instead of calling her Prissa. And, uh, you know, when we're over in Russia, his, you know, the guy's name is uh, Mikhail, but everybody calls him Misha, you know, or his name is Pavel, everybody calls him Pasha. They add Sha to the end of everything to make it, you know, sound cute and, and familiar. And uh, apparently they added Illa to, na <laughs> to names to uh, make them sound more familiar. But Paul uses her official name. Priscilla and Aquila were tent makers like Paul. They also were believers, and they were one of his uh, most frequent ministry companions. They were the ones, when they heard Apollos preaching in Ephesus, Apollos was preaching that John the Baptist had said that the Messiah has come, and we've got to repent and be ready. And they were like, hey, man, you're absolutely right. But do you know that he did come, and his name was Jesus Christ, and he died on the cross and rose from the dead? Priscilla and Aquila were the ones that discipled Apollos. Some people in the early church speculated Apollos might even have been the one that wrote Hebrews. And if that's the case, it means that Priscilla and Aquila discipled somebody who even wrote Scripture. He also mentions that they saved his life. They risked their necks for my life. We don't know what that story is, but it just tells you that they've got some history together, right? 
And he says that there was a church meeting in their house. This is how it was done in some of the cities like this that were so big, and there was persecution against the church. He's going to mention several times that there are people who had churches in their house. Now, if you thought reading the fact that Phoebe was a diakonos and therefore trying to upend the New Testament's teaching about gender was making a mountain out of a molehill, check this one out. There are those who say, obviously, Priscilla was in charge. You say, how can you say that? Because her name is listed first. That's it. There are people that say because Priscilla was listed first before her husband, therefore, Paul had no problem with women teachers. Therefore, he had no problem with women pastors. Therefore, he didn't actually write what he said in 1 Timothy. Therefore, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus should be removed from the Bible because Priscilla's name is listed first. That's an actual thing that actual people have written and said. It's like, really? Because it's like, I can imagine if you ever like brought Paul back in a time machine and asked him, why did you put her name instead of his? He goes, I don't know. Why not? It flowed better, Priscilla and Aquila. I don't know. It flowed better than, than the other way around. But to, to try to do that and, and say she had to be in charge because her name was lifted first, I, I think you can see. It's too far. It's like, why can't it just be that this is the way they listed their names? For sometimes, for us, it's more respectful to have the lady said first. It, it doesn't matter. Later on, he's going to give another husband and wife team, and he's going to do it the other way. But we're not going to, you know, it's, it, you can't just, you can't take these little things and then disrupt established doctrine from other places. Again, Priscilla was wonderful. What happens when people do that? They put regular Christians on the defensive, where we feel like we've got to defend the way that the Bible has established marriage and roles and gender in the church, and then we end up like being too rigid on some of this stuff because we're, we're trying to defend against this weirdness over here. This, you know, the same people that come out and say there is no such thing as gender, there's no such thing as male or female, and marriage is a social construct of, and a tool of oppression. So in order to defend against that, we've got to come over here and we don't want to make too big a deal out of Phoebe or Priscilla or Mary because we're afraid we're going to be lumped in with that group. Well, we need to make sure we don't do that either. Priscilla was awesome. She was one of Paul's traveling companions. She was in the room while her and, and Aquila were discipling Apollos and Phoebe was carrying the letter. You know, there's, there's, we've all known great godly women and there's no reason for us to think that the Bible teaches us anything different. Also, we can see from that, the last note is that apparently Priscilla and Aquila by this time had made it back to Rome after they had been exiled for a short time, but they're back in Rome now, and they're having a church in their house. He continues, greet my beloved Epanetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. This is not the continent of Asia. Of course, Israel is in the continent of Asia, so the first converts would have been the apostles. This is the Roman province of Asia, which is modern-day Turkey. So that's a pretty significant conversion, isn't it? That when they first started to come out of, the, uh, come out of their, in Jerusalem and Judea, and they went around the world of the Gentiles, Apenetus was the first one to get saved. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. There are about a million Marys in the New Testament. I'm sure you figured that out. Reason being, because the, the ang English word Mary is an anglicized version of the name Miriam. So they, all these women named Mary were named after Moses' sister, Miriam. And when you put that in Greek, it was Mariam. And that's how they went about it, and it would be shortened to Mary. Although, in this section, it doesn't say Mariam, it says Maria which is, of course, where the name Maria comes from. And it's entirely possible that this was also a, a Greek name that was completely unrelated to Miriam. And that would be why all of these Hebrew women who had the name Miriam, when they were in a Greek culture, they just went by Maria because it was close enough. If you've ever been to another culture, sometimes uh, you'll pick a name that's closer to theirs for that reason. Or I had a lot of friends in high school um, in Lynchburg, there's a huge Korean population, and a lot of them would come to America, and they would pick names that were close to their name, but they were English names because it just made it a little easier for folks. That could be what's going on here. And all it says about her is that she was a hard worker, as we all should be. Number seven, verse seven, greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. This is our last molehill out of which a feminist mountain has been attempted to be built. This is a very interesting pair, and believe it or not, that little verse has provoked 
the, some of the strongest debates of the book of Romans to date. Let me explain why. First of all, let's get the details out of the way. This was probably a husband and wife pair. Because they are named together, Andronicus and Junia, like Priscilla and Aquila, this is probably husband and wife. Paul says they were kinsmen, which probably means they were Jewish, although Andronicus is a very Greek name, as is Junia, but it could have been that they were Hellenistic Jews like Paul was, and they had been given uh, Greek names. It also could mean, although this is less likely, by calling them kinsmen, that they were family to Paul. They were related somehow. He says they were my fellow prisoners. Again, there's another one of these stories that just kind of, we have no idea the details of, but apparently Andronicus and Junia had been imprisoned either with Paul or they had also been imprisoned for Christ. And Paul then considered them fellow prisoners. And he also says they were saved before Paul. And Paul was saved very early on, which means Andronicus and Junia were probably saved in that first revival in the book of Acts after the Holy Spirit came down in Acts chapter 2. So when he says these thousands, 3,000 were saved this day, and 5,000 were saved that day, and you know, we don't know all those names, but in that crowd was Andronicus and Junia, who would go on to take the gospel all the way to Rome and even be imprisoned for it. Now this is where it gets interesting. It says, they are well known to the apostles. That word, to, is the Greek word, en, which is where we get our English word, in. So, a way to translate that, it could be well-known to the apostles. It could also be understood to mean they are well-known among the apostles or they are well-known as apostles, meaning out of all the apostles we have, they are especially well-known. Now, this is tricky because, of course, an apostle was an authoritative position, and we're right back to where we were. Junia is a female name, probably, there is possible that Junius was the name, but we have plenty of examples of the name Junia in this culture and none of Junius except right here. So it's possible that this is another man, but it's very unlikely. So therefore, if they are well known as apostles, here's Junia, Paul is calling her an apostle. And this is how most of the early church understood this, by the way. This is not a new idea. However, if you are a, an activist that has joined the church or joined a seminary in order to break up the Christian patriarchy and push your political agenda, and you read this, that there's this obscure passage that calls a woman an apostle, you're going to jump all over that. And they'd have. And what they'll say is, ah, see, therefore, there were female apostles. Therefore, when Paul wrote all these things about a woman should submit to her husband, etc., he was totally wrong. And all of Paul's writings should be ripped out of the New Testament. And really, we should break up the whole Bible because God only ever intended there to be equality. And we need to have, and on they go. This is a lot of what has come against the Southern Baptist Convention in recent years. If you've ever wondered what some of those debates are about, this is part of it. But... Again, you do not have to push it that far, and in fact, you shouldn't. First of all, we are assuming, and it's fair to assume, but we're assuming this is a female name. But second, even if we are assuming that, by saying we are assuming that N, the apostles, should be translated among. It also could be translated to, meaning even the apostles know who Andronicus and Junia are. But again, so we're going to make this other decision. They're known among the apostles, meaning they are. You've got to remember Paul and the New Testament make a decision between the lower case A apostles and the capital A apostles. Paul discusses the 12 a lot. And he's talking about Peter and James and John and Matthias and Bartholomew and all those guys. But then he also calls himself an apostle. And so then there are some that want to say, Man, Matthias shouldn't be an apostle because an apostle was one of the 12. No, 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 no. You had those apostles. And then you had somebody like Paul. Barnabas is also called an apostle. Timothy is called an apostle. Silas is called an apostle. And right here, Andronicus and Junia are called an apostle. What that means is an apostle was a sent out one. So I think what you're seeing here is Paul is saying, the kind of ministry I have traveling around, preaching the gospel to new people and establishing churches is the same kind of ministry that Andronicus and Junia had, which is the same kind of ministry that Barnabas and Mark had, which Overall, the highest authority were the 12 who had that position from Jerusalem. When you remember that, well, all of a sudden, we're not threatening any of the other teachings of Scripture. When you realize that what Paul is saying is what we have, Andronicus, Andronicus and Junia were a very effective, very well-known husband and wife missionary team. 
Is that so wild to consider? <laughs> Are we really going to go and start disrupting and ripping apart the book of Ephesians and 1 Timothy and Genesis because Paul had this here? And I would imagine they were a model of godly marriage. Ephesians 5.22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So if she was one of the apostles with a lowercase a, and I think it's perfectly uh, appropriate to assume that, then she would have been in submission to her husband like a good Christian woman should. She would have been an example to the church. She would have allowed her husband to lead, and she probably would have been involved in some kind of women's ministry. But in fact, even in other parts of the country, around the world, when we send out missionaries, when there's no other Christians, sometimes the ladies just have to step up and lead. I, there's a wonderful story from when we were doing ministry in Nepal, and we came across this church that had no pastor. And the only one who was saved there, I mean, forget other churches, the only one who was saved there was a woman, and I can't remember her name. I never met her personally. But she was asking if she could come to the pastor training because she said, I'm the only Christian here. I'm the only one that knows how to, that can teach this Bible. And she said, this is what she said to us. She said, I have been reading in scripture and I know that there ought to be male leadership in the church. I don't want to usurp that leadership, but there's nobody else there. Will you still train me until I can disciple a man to take over the leadership? That is the ultimate example of humility and being secure in your identity in Christ Jesus and a willingness to obey the text of Scripture as I've ever seen. So we trained her. Of course we did. She's not going to be weird about it. She understood it and she got it. It's really, un un it's really odd to me that we have to keep coming back to these things. By the way, if, if Priscilla being listed first means that she was in charge, what does it mean that Junia was listed second here? Does that completely under overturn your idea? You can't have it both ways. There's a principle of studying the Bible that I'm going to give you right now. You must let the didactic passages of Scripture interpret the narrative passages of Scripture. A didactic passage is a teaching passage, meaning when Paul is writing an epistle or Jesus is giving a commandment, those are very clear and very plain. They need to interpret the stories, not the other way around. So you can't come to a story, for example, and say, oh, look, Paul says that there was this woman who was a deacon and this other one who was an apostle. Clearly, there's no limits on female leadership in God's church. Well, no. Every time the Bible talks about leadership in God's church, it makes it very plain that it is to be the men who lead and the women who submit and who follow and who help and all the rest of that. Therefore, when you come to this passage, anything that might lead you to go against the didactic passage, say, well, that's probably not what's going on here. You let the didactic passages interpret the narrative passages. And by the way, this is such an obscure little section. To you know, we have chapters of teaching about this issue. And then to come to Paul's greetings at the end of Romans and say, oh, just kidding, we can unravel all of that. You're not going to do that unless you have a prior agenda to dismantle the structure of the church. And this is what these people do. And I really, I, I hope you hear me when I say this, that when I talk about feminist theologians, I know that's a politically loaded term and you maybe get defensive about that. Feminist theology is a stated theology that is going out of its way to undo the male perspective of scripture on purpose. Like this is not a secret, this is not a conspiracy. You can, you can go and read their books. This is their goal. Therefore, you'll excuse me if I don't take your opinion very seriously. Because we're not supposed to come to the Bible with any agenda on our own, are we? We're supposed to come and let the scripture teach us. And if you come in and you say, I got some things to say because I don't like the way the Bible teaches it. You are not somebody who should be handling scripture. And you say, this sounds like the activists we hear on, about on TV. It's the same people. Some of them say, I'm going to be a feminist activist and go to Washington. I'm going to be a feminist activist. I'm going to go to this group over here in this town. Others say, I'm going to join the seminary and I'll work on the churches from the inside. And this is what has happened to a lot of the mainline denominations. But I hope you can see this is, these are the legs that they try to stand on, and they're all pretty flimsy, if you ask me. But don't let it take away from the fact that we have people like Priscilla, like Phoebe, like Junia, who were so effective and so used in God's kingdom that Paul's like, these are some rock-solid Christians that you should look to for your example, right? People like Corey Ten Boom and Elizabeth Elliot and all the people who were never going to be celebrated or written about that you grew up with when you were in church, Maybe your mom or your grandmother. 
The Lord is not concerned about that kind of thing. So we're going to move on from that because it's, I feel kind of bad talking about it just because I, I think it's so plain when you look at it, the obvious text, but you may come across this. You may find it somewhere. You may hear about it in the news and they'll say things like, well, Junia was an apostle. You'll know what they mean when they say that. Let's keep going. Greet Ampliatus. Some great potential baby names for some of y'all in this section here. My beloved in the Lord. Then he says, greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Ampliatus and Stachys are beloved. Urbanus is as he was a fellow worker. Apparently he had worked with Paul at some point. And Apelles is approved. I wonder if there was something going on about that. I wonder if some people didn't like Apelles very much. Who knows? And then we got two very interesting notes. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. We know from history who Aristobulus and Narcissus were. They were not Christians. They were wealthy political leaders in the city of Rome. Aristobulus was a particular friend of the Herods, the Herodian dynasty, which is probably why Paul greets somebody named Herodian, who is living in the house of Aristobulus. By saying those who are in the household, check this out, he's not so much talking about sons and daughters and cousins. He's talking about slaves that were working in the household of Aristobulus and Narcissus, douloi, that were working in their households. So what's really something you can see here is that there is no distinction of class in the book of Romans. He says, greet them. Then he gets, uh, moves on. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa, probably twins, because their names are very close. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Another female hard worker, just like Mary in this chapter. Persis is the Greek name for Persian. So perhaps she was of Persian extraction. Verse 13, another cool one. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. My friend had a Shih Tzu dog named Rufus, and I always think of that when I read this verse. Also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Rufus was the son of Simon of Cyrene, who carried Jesus' cross. Remember that story? Jesus couldn't carry his cross in Mark 15, and they got this guy out of the crowd. And it, when you read the story, it says, they chose Simon of Cyrene, who was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, we don't know who those people are, but when Peter's writing the story and Mark's helping him write it down, he says, yeah, that was Rufus' dad. This is Rufus. Simon of Cyrene was saved, and his son was in Rome. And he also says that his mother had been a mother to him as well. So apparently, Paul was pretty tight with the family of Simon of Cyrene, and his mom had taken good care of him at some point. Verse 14, greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobas, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. This probably represents a house church. These are all the people that are together in one house. Then in verse 15, we see it again, greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister. That's probably a nuclear family, father, dad, son, and sister. And Olympus and all the saints who are with them. Again, probably another house church here. Greet one another with a holy kiss. We're going to practice that right now. Turn to your neighbor and give him. No, just kidding. <laughs> Unless you're married, then it's fine. Go for it. All the churches of Christ greet you. It's wonderful to me to peek behind history's curtain and see our brothers and sisters from another age, even just to read their names. And we're not going to know much about them. But like I said, some of these names are very obviously identified. This is a name that was commonly given to slaves. This was a name of the nobility. And they're all together in the church of Christ. And you need to remember, by the way, we are not the first or best generation to ever live in God's church. Protestants can have a really bad attitude about church history. We shouldn't. We really shouldn't. Yes, we believe that the Reformation was a good thing, but that doesn't undo everything that came before it. There have always, always been godly men and women around the world, and I, for one, love to study church history. It's very challenging, and it's very encouraging, too. You're not alone. All right, verse 17 through 20 now. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles, contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. 
For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Don't you love that? That's a reference back to Genesis 3.15, that he will crush the head of the serpent. But because we are in Christ, then Satan's going to be crushed under our feet too. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. You don't got to be scared of the devil. He's a defeated foe. So after listing all of those names, it makes a lot of sense for Paul to say what he does, which is don't be divided and look out for scoundrels that want to come into the church and split up this wonderful family that he just outlined. And he identifies people who want to cause trouble. We don't know that anything was happening in Rome, but Paul had run into plenty of people like this. And he urges them to be on the lookout. And he says, I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent to what is evil. It's like in Matthew 10 when Jesus said to be wise as serpents, but innocent or humble as doves. And he gives four characteristics of divisive false teachers. And we're going to go through these rather quickly. But first thing is they cause divisions. How do you know when somebody's sneaking into the church and they're kind of trying to cause trouble? If they try to cause divisions. People who come in and try to gather followers around themselves. People that like to to establish cliques. People who like to have certain people over to their house for an extra special Bible study that no one else can come to. People that are just kind of throw their weight around a little bit. Well, pastor, we really think you ought to move the service time to 10, p- 10 a.m. 10 p.m. 10 a.m. And so, oh, well, you know, we're sticking with this. Well, a lot of us have been talking, and maybe we, will, maybe we should find another church that will, you know, be more uh, conducive to our needs. And, you know, we do tithe an awful lot. That's a divisive person. By the way, if you ever try that with me, I'm probably going to yell at you. Don't do that. <laughs> All right? We're not going to put up with that here. I don't know who tithes what, and I don't really pay much attention to what goes on in most of the ministries because I am not the one to assert myself and, and be manipulated and pushed around in that way. But don't let, if somebody comes in and tries to do that to you and is like, oh man, I love this church, don't, but you know, some of those people are just a little, right? I mean, I, don't, I hope he doesn't come to this service. I might be able to finally enjoy myself. You, you yell at him then. You, know, you, you have my permission. You rebuke that. No, 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 we don't do that here. No, no, we're not going to divide over that. Come on, you don't think that she's annoying? Like, we're not having this conversation. That's my sister, and that's your sister. And if I am going to continue in this conversation, then I'm going to owe her an apology. If somebody were to come to me and do this for you, I'd be doing the exact same thing. Second of all, they teach contrary to the doctrine. Contrary to the doctrine. What doctrine? Everything we just read in Romans. Condemnation, justification, sanctification, glorification. They're going to question the foundations of the gospel. They're going to come in and they're going to have ideas that they want to float out there. Like, I mean, yeah, but if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, I mean, it's all still true, right? You should have some alarm bells going off in your head. And if they've always got some idea that's just a little off, that makes you go, where did you get that? Because I don't think you got it from Scripture. Well, you know, hey, I've been reading the Quran, and they've got some good ideas. And it's very similar, similar to this. Oh, this happens, you guys. It happens. Contrary to the doctrine. You know, I've just really, I, I know that there's something to grasp. I believe God's truth is everywhere. I mean, it's not just limited to Jesus. Watch out for people like that, Paul says. Third, they serve their own appetites. Paul says they don't serve Christ. They have no, haven't you ever known somebody that they're in the church, but they have no loyalty to Jesus? You talk about the person of Jesus Christ, and it's, you know, whatever. You know, I, I believe that the church is here to provide social glue for our culture, and I think that's a good thing. Okay, but what about Jesus, though? What about the person of Jesus? What about the fact that this is, this is for everybody, not just for our culture, not just for our day? But instead, they serve their own appetites. Like later on, I think in Philippians, Paul says there are people whose God is their belly. Whether they're trying to satisfy their own sexual appetites, meaning they come into the church so that they can prey on church girls or church men. That happens quite a bit. Financial appetites. They're trying to make money off the church. They got anger. They want to exercise their anger. They got some stuff to say. That's why they want to be on that platform so that they can stand up and rant about all the stuff going on. 
Or maybe it's just pride. They want people to like them and know them. And you'll see this in churches where somebody walks in the room and they just got like a little posse around them. And they just kind of sit there and they just kind of like are holding court with all these people. Avoid people like that. And the fourth thing is they use flattery to get their way. Puffing up, he says, especially naive people. This means especially the people that are new in the faith, especially the folks that are not as strong as others, that aren't as taught. Because you're not going to be able to get one over on somebody who is mature in Christ. So you've got somebody who's immature in Christ. And you say things like, you're probably like the most spiritual person I've ever met. Why don't they let you preach? Well, I've only been saved a little while. Hey, it doesn't matter how long. Just You've got such great ideas. and Man, you're, you, you're so smart and you're so, so spiritual and kind and loving and much better than all these other people. And yeah, you know, I kind of brought this up to pastor and he was pretty stern with me about that. But, you know, thank you for listening. You're so, you're so receptive, just like I think Jesus wants us to be. And you kind of go, wow, they, they really, maybe I am a spiritual person. I want to be spiritual. And this person seems to know an awful lot about it. And what are they doing? They're trying to manipulate you. What's the solution to people like that? Paul says, avoid them. Don't you like that? Paul doesn't say, now listen, we welcome everybody and make sure that they're a part of it. No, avoid them. A person like that is not going to get a lick of authority in this church, I'll tell you that. Don't give them the time of day. If somebody walks in and they say, hey, how's it going? Like, look, I know what you're trying to do. I'm not going to be part of that. No. I'm not, we're not having this conversation. There have been, a, not many, I can think of one, maybe two people that have tried to do that here. It's never really gone anywhere because usually you can tell right away. And most of the time, y'all do the work for me. So yeah, she had this thing where she like was just trying to pump herself up and she wanted everybody to follow her and she didn't want to do what we were doing. She wanted to do her own thing. And it's like, well, we've already got something and then she was gone. I mean, that happens because people are trying to find opportunities, especially in small churches, they think, I can't climb the ladder at work, I'm unsatisfied in my marriage, and nobody cares about me in the rest of the world, but I can come to this church, and maybe now I can be the, the top dog at this place. Avoid them. And there's a special warning, by the way, for healthy churches. He says, your obedience is known to all. Healthy churches especially need to walk out, watch out for this. It could be easier for a healthy church to deal with it at first, but sometimes we can be so willing to show grace and love that we allow somebody to have a voice that they should not be allowed to have. 2 Timothy 4, Paul wrote, The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Today, the proliferation of videos and books and podcasts and blogs has given a really loud megaphone to a lot of people like this. And because people in the church have itching ears, they want to hear according to their passions, meaning they want you to talk about the thing I want to talk about. Yeah, I know sound Bible teaching is great, but I need a little red meat every once in a while. Get, all, you know, get me all fired up, get me all angry. And so you go and find people like that on the internet there's a million churches in this town. I'm sure you could find some that are going to teach, teach it your way. It's a shame. And I'm telling you, 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 I said this before, especially if you're finding there's so many great Bible teachers online and so many great books and so many great podcasts and teachers, there's no reason for you to go for a bad one. There's no reason for you to chase the weird guy when the good guys are everywhere. So don't, you know, if somebody especially is, if they're not a pastor anywhere, or if they're not recognized, and, and I don't want to say authorized, but I'll say authorized, by a, a congregation of people that has to put up with them. Sometimes these people have blogs and podcasts because that pastor's not going to let them teach. There's no church in the world that's going to let that guy stand in the pulpit. But YouTube is free. <laughs> There's no background check to have a blog on the Internet. Don't, just because it says Christian teacher doesn't mean it deserves your time of day. Look for the kind of person that you'd be willing to go to their church and learn from them. Because while we, as we learned in chapter 14 and 15, we have liberty and love on every matter of opinion. And we've got to learn to get along and not make a big deal out of those things. The reason we do that is because we don't budge on the cardinal doctrines of the church. We do not budge. We don't even have the discussion. The gospel. There is only one way to heaven and his name is Jesus Christ. 
He died on the cross and rose from the dead on the third day, and he's coming back to get us. If you don't believe that, you are outside the pale of Christianity, and you are a false teacher. Or you've been deceived, and we'd love to tell you the truth. I mean, the person of Jesus Christ. He was God in the flesh. He was 100% God, 100% man. He lived a sinless life. He was virgin born. He died on the cross and rose again, as I said. If you don't believe those things, again, you are outside the pale of Christianity. And I know people don't like you to exclude anybody, but we have to. Speaking of the person of Jesus Christ, the Trinity, we don't budge on that. You budge on the Trinity, you're going to budge on everything else. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. One in substance, three in person. This has been doctrine in the church since the beginning. And we don't waver on that. Because you start to mess with it. People will ask you, what does it matter if we adjust the Trinity and we mess with it? First of all, find out a church that has done that and see how it's functioning. Secondly, I want you go home and do this in your mind. If you say, okay, what if the Trinity wasn't true? Could we still have the gospel? You can't. Because everything that Jesus said becomes a lie. And everything that he did is not what we think it was. If he was just a man, how was he supposed to die for all of us? Scripture. We believe in the inerrancy and inspiration of Scripture. The 66 books in your lap and no others. If you're going to say, well, you know, I really like some of these other things. You know, Joseph Smith had some good ideas. Or, you know, have you read any of these apocryphal books in the, in the intertestamental period? Have you read Enoch? Have you read? Yeah, I've read them. They're weird. <laughs> and they were never recognized as Scripture by either the Jews or the New Testament Christians. So 2,000 years later, it's a little late, my friend, to start adding books. Wouldn't you agree? The world is already hostile to the church, so we're not going to let somebody come in and cause trouble in our midst. We stick together on the only things that can actually hold us, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Coming to the end now, verse 21. These are some familiar names, maybe. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. We know Timothy. Timothy was a Galatian. Timothy was from Lystra. His mother was a Jew and his father was a Gentile. Paul took him along with him as his traveling companion. He was a co-writer of several of the books of the New Testament, something we forget a lot, that Paul had co-writers in almost all of his books. Romans is one of the exceptions. He became the pastor in the city of Ephesus, and he was martyred for his faith. Then we have, so do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen. Because it says kinsmen, again, these were probably Jews, unless Paul is using it figuratively, like, these are my boys, right? These are my brothers. But he's probably saying these are, these are Jewish followers. Lucius could be Luke. It could be an alternate form of Luke, who, of course, was the great the physician that wrote the book of Acts and the gospel of Luke. Uh, It also could have been Lucius of Cyrene, who was one of the other elders in Antioch from Acts 13. Uh, It could be a different Lucius. This is the difficulty with some of this, about making anything too strong out of these lists, because it really could be a number of things. I don't think this was Luke, because it seems very strongly that Luke was a Gentile, and he's here. If if kinsman means Jew, then it's probably not Luke. Also, every other place, the name for Luke is Lucanos, not Lucius although it it could have been. Jason, the other Jason we have in the book of Acts is Jason from Thessalonica. He was the one that hosted Paul in his house and was taken before the judge and had to post bond in order to keep having Paul there. But it also was a common name, named after Jason and the Golden Fleece, the Argonauts, right? So it could have been a different guy. Sosipater is most likely Sopater from Berea. And again, Luke always uses the diminutive forms of the names in the book of Acts. Sopater is the diminutive form of Sosipater. In Acts chapter 20, it tells us that he was one of the ones who went with Paul to Jerusalem with the collection. So it makes an awful lot of sense that this is that same guy. So we have here a Galatian. We maybe have Luke, who is from Troas. We have a Thessalonian and a Berean, if this is who we think they are. It's kind of cool that you're kind of getting a cross-section of Paul's missionary journeys here. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Tertius, who wrote this letter, does that mean that Paul didn't write it? No, no, no. Tertius was the scribe. Tertius was the one that wrote it down. 
This, the formal word there is amanuensis. You don't need to memorize it, but if you read it, that's what it means. And he says, I greet you in the Lord, which tells us that this scribe was a Christian. He was one of Paul's traveling companions, or maybe just somebody in the church of Corinth, a scribe who had gotten saved. Uh, Paul didn't write his own letters by hand. If you read through the ends of most of them, he'll say things like, I, Paul, write this with my own hand, as in, I'll sign it, but I'm not going to actually write it all down. So maybe that adjusts how you think of Paul writing these letters, is rather than him hunched over the desk with his, with his quill pen, that maybe he's pacing around, speaking it out loud, and Tertius is trying to keep up, or Timothy, or whoever it was, writing it down. And then he says, Gaius, who is host to me in the whole church, there are several Gaiuses in the New Testament. Acts 18 tells us that in Corinth, Paul stated the house of a man named Titius Justus. So it could be that this was Gaius Titius Justus was his full name, or that Paul had changed houses. That's entirely possible too. And then he says, Erastus, the city treasurer. We know for a fact that Erastus was a city official in Corinth. We have engravings from this time period that talk about Erastus, who was a city official. So he was a Christian. Isn't that cool? And then our brother Quartus greet you. Quartus' name means fourth. And this is a very common slave name, as many of these were, as I said. So you've got the city treasurer, and you've got a doulos, a slave of the time. And they were all working for the common goal of the gospel. Now, note here, if you have an older translation, you probably have verse 24. The newer ones do not. It says in Romans 16, 24, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. This is an example of a textual issue, textual problem. It's called a variant, meaning we have old copies of the book of Romans that include verse 24 and copies that don't include verse 24. This is an interesting one because the early church knew about this variant all the way back. I think the first one to write about this was Origen, and then Augustine wrote about it too, meaning they knew about this variant from a very early time. Why is that? This one is actually pretty easy to figure out uh, because the doxology, meaning that we're about to read from verse 25 through 27, is found at like three or four different places depending on the copy of Romans that you have. Sometimes they put it at the end of chapter, if I'm not mistaken, chapter 12 or 13 after some of the instruction. Sometimes it's after chapter 15. Sometimes it's before chapter 15 because there were shorter versions that kind of cut out all of the greetings and things that were passed around. We also know there was a false teacher named Marcion who loved to chop up the different books of Paul and he hated Romans 9, 10, and 11 because it was very pro-Jewish and Marcion really hated Jews. I wonder why he bothered with this religion in the first place if he hated Jews so much. But he moved the doxology all the way there to end it earlier. So what probably happens is somebody gets hold of this letter. The doxology is earlier. And then they get to the end and it ends by saying, our brother Cortes greets you. And they go, all right, what else does Paul say at the end of his letters? Uh, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That's what he says everywhere else. So we're not really gaining or losing doctrine here. We're just trying to make sure that we have the closest to the original that we have. And all of the oldest versions of Romans that we find have uh, verse 23 going straight to verse 25. All the oldest ones that we find. Now, this, this is not an insidious thing. Like people are trying to corrupt the scripture. It's actually a correction, right? If we, if we find that something has been added or something has been moved, then we want to know about it. <laughs> and this is what's so wonderful about living in the time in which we're living, is that we are discovering older and older and older copies of the New Testament. I think the oldest one we have now is, is from something like the 60s AD, which is like, that's like 10 years, man. That's like 10 or 20 years after it was written. I think it's a fraction of the Gospel of Mark, if I'm not mistaken. So the fact that we have all these and we see that some things were added or maybe were twisted or written differently, then we can correct it. So that's why it's not there. If you say, I still like it and I want to keep it, it does not add or take away anything from the doctrine of the church. Okay? But that's why it's there. Verse 25 through 27, coming to the close. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, According to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations. According to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, 
Amen. He glorifies God, the one that can strengthen you according to the gospel that I just preached to you. He describes one more time the mystery of Jews and Gentiles brought together. The sovereignty of God to bring the whole world together under one name, and that is of Jesus Christ. It's been the plan of God since the beginning. Genesis 12, 3, he said, In you all the nations of the world shall be blessed. Isaiah 49, 6, he said, It is too light that my Messiah should only save the Jews. He's going to save all. All nations. God has done in Jesus Christ what no diversity program or revolutionary government or well meaning individual is able to accomplish to produce true harmony between disparate people because we're united by Christ and his gospel. This is why we can't compromise it. That's why we can't let people to come in and weasel around and make changes because it's the only thing that holds us together. And it's what God has been promising and leading towards since the very beginning. That's the end of Romans. And I think it's a fitting place for us to say amen. I'll put it this way. Romans is the theological load bearer of the New Testament. My uh, professor used to say in school, all roads lead to Romans when you're doing Bible study. Eventually, you're going to get there. And I hope you've learned it well. Some of you came in uh, towards the end or in the middle. Go back and learn the rest of it. It's a lot of abstract doctrine, I know. But today we were reminded by reading all those names, all of that abstract doctrine comes to real life in the people of the church. And everything that we have read and studied, it is our responsibility to defend it and stick together over it to the praise of Jesus Christ. And if you have not yet Put your faith in these things, in the death and resurrection of Jesus, and join the family. You can join the family. This group of people, this motley crew in here, just as, as special to the Lord as the names that we just read in the book of Romans. I pray the Lord will press these truths deep down into our hearts and that those seeds will bear good fruit. And even if you can't remember everything, you'll remember enough to grow a little more. And then the next time you come back to it, you'll gain and remember a little bit more as the Lord grows us together into maturity of Jesus Christ. Amen?